Praise be Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to the traditional Thomas. For those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome. My name is Nicholas Cavazos, and I got the great Timothy S. Flanders from The Meaning of Catholic and the editor of 1 Peter 5 back on the show. Uh, Mr. Flanders, you came back on, I think, three or four months ago, and uh, actually, you were one of my most popular guests that I've had on, so welcome back. Hey, hey, man. Uh, I, I appreciate your channel. I was uh, re watching some of your videos recently i really loved your video on uh what is a theologian that was an awesome video nice job with that so uh yeah happy to be here looking forward to the conversation brother absolutely i appreciate it thank you well cool well as all of you guys know who are probably watching this video as of right now we are in the middle of passion tide passion week which means that next week is holy week so it's our um, I guess holiest time of the year, but it's also the uh, most ancient time of the year we have when it comes to liturgy. Most of the liturgies that we celebrate, at least in, as traditional Catholics or even as Eastern Catholics, are fairly ancient at this time. So what, what I wanted to do was kind of address a controversy that's in the traditional world, the controversy of pre-1955 versus 1962 Holy Week. Is there a better one? Does a particular rite better express the traditional faith? Does the other one, which one works better? I myself have only ever gone to the 62 in person. Um, and I've seen the pre-55 online, although this will be my first year actually getting to go. And so before we begin, one thing that I was curious about, Mr. Flanders, is you are an Orthodox convert to Catholicism. And... I know you've read the distinctions between pre-55 and post, but one thing I was at least kind of curious about was, in your per opinion, how close is the pre-55 Roman liturgy to an Eastern Rite liturgy? Would you say it's at least much more of a cousin than the 62, or are they really fairly broadly apart? Uh, there, I mean, I think there's, there's different different ways to say that uh the eastern rite is just really so much different than the roman rite it's really a different world it's just like going to a different country and that speaks mm -hmm. a different language and mm -hmm. it's really quite foreign i think uh except for major elements that you know ad orientum for example mm -hmm. um and holy week in i think lent actually shows the biggest differences really to me one of the biggest striking differences for example in in the greek rite during lent on fridays during lent we have the stations of the cross they have mm -hmm. the akathist hymn to the mother of god mm -hmm. which i as an eastern orthodox I, I i spent four years in the eastern orthodox liturgy and mm -hmm. i just never really got used to that obviously i love the mother of god but mm -hmm. fridays in lent it's just like it just doesn't seem like a you know pen, i don't know it just didn't yeah. seem like it was the right thing to do for me like just for my you know i'm i am a latin i'm not a greek i just never really got used to that but that's uh -huh. an example but um there are many beloved liturgies in the holy week of the greek rite i think the the most striking similarity is that there is the anticipated time which i think is one of the most conspicuous differences between 55 and 62 is that the mass of holy thursday or maundy thursday the whole mass of the triduum they're all in the morning including easter vigil is on saturday morning and that's the same in the eastern rite so for four years i went through the greek rite and i was used to the morning and mm -hmm. so i can speak to that aspect of it but besides that um there are there are processions there are there's a sepulcher 
there's like uh you know there's a crucifixion scene there's crosses there's burying there's there's a whole lamentation at the lord's tomb that's a that's a great thing about the eastern rite in the holy week there's the bridegroom service it's like kind of a, a parallel to tenebrae tenebrae mm -hmm. they love tenebrae in the west there's there's a, a sort of a not really a similar service in any way but similar in the sense that it is a it is an office it is a divine office service mm -hmm. uh which is beloved in the east and it's called the bribe group bribe groom matins so it's the same service it's like the same morning service that takes place in the evening because it's mm -hmm. anticipated um so i i would say however i would still say that the 55 and 62 are are really except for the time difference mm -hmm. like the time difference certainly is is the same east and west mm -hmm. between the 55 and the east right right but other than that, I, I, I would still say that the 55 and 62 are far more similar to each other simply because mm -hmm. just having the Roman Rite, Latin, everything Western is just so much more familiar, mm -hmm. even if it's at a different time. That's just my opinion, my experience. Yeah, and that would make sense on a tangible level, especially like when you're just using your senses, seeing, as you said, the Latin as opposed to another language, that would definitely be the case. One thing I want the viewers to know is kind of like our thesis here at the beginning of the show. Um, before I even launch on our thesis, what's interesting about this subject is that this is kind of a, uh, a hot topic, if you will, in the world of traditionalists. I myself, uh, as the viewers know, go to an SSPX chapel. However, the SSPX has kind of had a somewhat turbulent experience with questions around the pre-55 because of different breakups with different other groups like say the SSPV or other more openly Setic Avantis groups in the past. And so even though the SSPX uses the 1962 missile, I want to talk about as kind of our thesis in this show that the, the principles, the underlying principles that you do see in the changes of Holy Week in 1955 fundamentally are going to be the same changes that you do see applied to um, the new missile as a whole. And so that's something that we want to get into. So before we really start looking at the similar or the differences, I wanted to kind of go over, if it was okay with you, kind of a timeline of some of the changes, because one thing I appreciate about your show is that I feel like you take a very balanced and academic perspective when it comes to elements of traditional thought. Um, in the sense that there's kind of two types of, of trads in my, in my, or maybe three types in my book. There's, there's the, the one who spends all day long on these very obscure blog post forums, who's learning about, you know, fake sister Lucia. And he's just like, there's a Mason under every pillow. And, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it, it's kind of like you've reached the third level, if you will. And he's just like, yes, everyone's a modernist, but me. Um, type of <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a scary place to be in. And actually, one thing I really liked was, and I'll, I'll link it in the description, was your guys' episode that you, you did a day ago, two days ago. It was uh, taking too many red pills. And the analogy... Yeah, that was Kennedy. <laughs> it was wonderful. The analogy to Plato's cave, I thought, was the perfect description of that kind of traditionalist, this person who takes the red pill, but then um, creates his own cave. And that's really what you do when you start to become that type of a person. The other end of the spectrum is, I would say, a much better perspective. This would be the person who is very much so studying the books, studying the sources, trying to piece this together, if you will, um, using academia. And that's what I strive for. But the one pitfall you can fall into this is, uh, again, the first and foremost um, thing a theologian should be pursuing is a life of prayer. So sometimes you can get so obsessed with studies that you omit things that you actually need to do according to divine justice. And so it, it's it's like I've told my viewers before in the past, it's if you can name for me the, you know, all the three secrets of Fatima, but you can't tell me what the purgative way is, you know, you're doing it wrong. You should know both, right? But you should, there's a hierarchy of importance. And then there's the, I guess, the one in the middle who's just the Catholic who wants to save his soul and is you know just kind of picking up things from all kind of different areas and i think that's a good amount of people but with this being the case looking at this timeline i want to dispel real quick for the viewers that the latin mass missile kind of just fell out of heaven as it was perfectly preserved i guess in heaven uh just out of the sky to the apostles that's something that you would you would maybe find 
no one would say that, but kind of that attitude you would find in certain traditional camps. And so what I wanted to do is investigate kind of this natural and organic um, development of the liturgy and see where it starts to really go uh, off the rails. And so at least for the purposes of our discussion, what I'm wanting to look at is the uh, first and foremost, in 1911, Pope St. Pius X of Happy Memory, he introduced a new arrangement to the Psalms. And this was, you know, at least in my own personal life, I've talked to people who could kind of care less about this subject, about him arranging the Psalms this way, and other people are really adamant. I myself, to be honest, have not done a huge amount of research into the said subject. I just know that the breviary that I pray has that similar arrangement, and I know that it may be a different arrangement than it was in the past, although I think the, the substance of the breviary is there with all 150 psalms. In 1942, we have the development where we could have a wedding take place outside of the context of Mass, so a couple can come to the priest, ask to get married, and the, the rite of Mass according to my knowledge, kind of became separate from that of the mass itself, the rite of the wedding. In 1949, Pius XII allowed the mass in the vernacular for the Chinese, except for the Roman canon, which had to remain in Latin. Um, and I believe this was in the context of, although I could be wrong with this, but maybe the underground church. Do you know anything about that? Was that kind of the that context of there? Uh, no, I don't really know. I know that the vernacular was permitted in various places and local places but i don't know the context in each okay. case yeah it's something for us for us to look up because i've been curious that's what, something i think i've heard before is that it was in that context but i'm not entirely sure so take that with a grain of salt everyone uh, in 1951 there was the provisional holy week and then in 1955 of course the actual promulgation of the new holy week and this involved amongst other things which we're going to get into things along the nature of the priest being much more at the chair as opposed to the altar um reading the epistle from the chair or at least hearing this this is something that you see in in the 1962 missile as a whole when you're observing the solemn high mass you'll notice that when the epistle is read or being chanted that the priest will be sitting down in the pre-55 uh, missal, you'll see that the priest is going to be up there on the altar, even while the subdeacon is chanting this, he'll be up there on the altar saying the epistle silently. And this is to represent the fact that the that the, the readings at Mass, though they are for the instruction of the faithful, their primary end is to offer up that sacrifice of praise to God. That's why, you know, it being on the altar. So you see images along this nature. And then to accommodate this in 1957, we see that with the promulgation of the 55, all the, the times of the liturgies start to get changed. And so we're now starting to have um, the vigils of Monday, Thursday and uh, Holy Saturday in the evenings, as opposed to noon or even earlier in the mornings. And this, and to accommodate this, Pope Pius XII in 1957 accommodated that we could change the Eucharistic fast from midnight to three hours. Um, and this was something that if you go and you read uh, kind of an, uh, antique 1962 missiles, you'll find uh, usually somewhere, it will say something to the effect of the old custom is still recommended, but those who take part in the new custom should, I think it uses the language of something like they should shine forth in Christian excellence. You know, it, was, it wasn't like, all right, it doesn't really matter. You know, they definitely wanted you to practice a holy and rigorous life. Um, and then in 1958, Pius XII, months before he died, uh, gave to the more liberal bishops conferences at the time in Germany and Austria and German speaking Switzerland, the, the permission to say the epistle and the gospel in the vernacular language um, without having to read the Latin. And I think that that was a big thing because dialogue masses we're already having, even at my own mass, we have it said in Latin, but then the vernacular up at the pulpit. Um, that's very common, but this was just allowing it to be vernacular only during the readings. And then in 1958, um, Pope John the 23rd was elected Pope. And interestingly enough, he said the pre-55 Holy Week um, originally, and most priests around the world at that time definitely were not fans of, the, uh, of the, the Holy Week of 1955. They definitely preferred the older one, um, and you can see, I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen um, for the video itself, but there is the famous photo of 
John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd, uh, adoring the cross of our Lord on Good Friday. And that's just a really powerful and moving image. Also, one thing that is interesting about this is that uh, or in the originally in 1955, only one host was consecrated on Good Friday, whereas in the post-1955 Holy Week, um, communion is served to the faithful. In 1959, uh, the chain, I, I, this is a, definitely something I'm wanting to, to cover today, but in 1959, the Good Friday prayer was changed drastically by removing the term faithlessness, faithless from the prayer to, for the Jews. Um, and St. Joseph's name was also added to the canon. 1962, the 1962 and the final edition of the Tridentine Missal, at least to this date, <laughs> hypothetically, came out. And then in 1962, of course, the Second Vatican Council opens. In 1964, Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, uh, changes the Eucharistic fast from three hours to one hour. And then also in 64, the Leonine prayers are suppressed. In 1965, the kind of temporary uh, Vatican II mass kind of came out. Vernacular was encouraged. Freestanding tables were there instead of uh, altars that were attached to the wall. And prayers at the foot, as well as the last gospel that you see in the Latin mass were omitted. In 1967, laity were allowed to touch the chalice and have communion under both species. And Paul VI also allowed marriage of deacons. Deacons were now allowed to be married. And then finally, to wrap this up, in 1968, Paul VI did another two things. He first and foremost drastically changed the consecration and ordination of holy orders, along with um, communion being allowed by indult in the hand in countries like France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. In 1969, the new mass itself was uh, promulgated, and then it was published in 1970. And then in 1970, of course, was the creation of the Society of St. Pius X by Archbishop Lopez. So for the viewers, that's kind of like a broad history right there, kind of a, uh, a snapshot, if you will, of everything that has taken place thus far. One of the first things I wanted to kind of ask you about, Mr. Flanders, was um, what were the intentions of a lot of these reformers? Because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people kind of um, you know, they'll kind of just accept things kind of ad lib or ad hoc, but it is very important for us to know the intentions behind things because, you know, even hypothetically, a priest, right, this is a different situation, but a priest could have the correct form matter, matter be a validly ordained minister, but have an intention to not do what the church does in consecrating the Eucharist, right? Um, and so intention does matter. And so I was just curious about your thoughts. What were the intentions behind a lot of these reformers? Well, yeah, um, I think that historically we can point to good and bad intentions. I think there's a mixture. And I think that the analogy that I want to draw when we discuss this is the controversy regarding the Vulgate. Mm -hmm. uh, because when the Vulgate first began, the project under St. Jerome, mm -hmm. there was a huge dispute between St. Jerome and St. Augustine about the Vulgate. Now, we think the Vulgate is, you know, traditional, but actually at the time it was extremely innovative because there was an old Latin version that had been passed down and was used in the liturgy. And uh, Saint, Pope St. Saint Damasus had commissioned St. Jerome to basically go and research and try to make a, a better version of the Bible that was more accurate to the best estimation of the original text. And mm -hmm. so he did so and he created the Vulgate. But there were certain discrepancies between his Vulgate, which he used all the best manuscripts that he could get his hands on, both Latin, Greek, and as well as Hebrew. Mm -hmm. There were discrepancies between that and the, the old Latin text in the Psalter, the old Latin text that was in the Missal itself. Mm -hmm. And um, so who's right, Jerome or Augustine? Well, they're actually both right in different ways. Because on the one hand, we have Augustine, who is simply defending the continuity of tradition mm -hmm. um but the church is always in a process of guarding the tradition and also sort of deepening that deepening that tradition and recovering that tradition mm -hmm. and so when you know saint thomas aquinas they just recovered aristotle aristotle was a recovery of a, actually a pre-christian tradition but it was a deepening of the tradition it was like a development a true development not a not a modernist development but a true development 
And so Jerome is uh, deepening that tradition, mm -hmm. uh, d making making it better by by bringing out new discoveries, like new manuscripts, uh, new arch true archaeology, true research. Mm -hmm. So this is. But what did the church do? They actually kept both. And this is why both Augustine and Jerome are both right. And this is what is analogous to the liturgy, because what happened, which is interesting, what I speak about in my first book, is that after the Clementine Vulgate came out, after the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. they actually wanted to change the Roman Missal to accord with the Vulgate. So when we say, for example, just a very conspicuous example of Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deo, Sabaot. Sabaot mm -hmm. is from the old Latin. It's mm -hmm. not in the Vulgate. You look it up in the Vulgate, it says exercitum, which is the same same term. It means the same thing. But Sabaot is a, a Hebraization, Hebraization, or mm -hmm. sorry, a Latinization of a Hebrew word. Um, and so they actually started publishing missiles and they changed all the words to accord with the new Vulgate. And um, Pope Clement VIII condemned this in 1604 he said no, no 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 we can't we can't do this this is this is the true and proper approach here and this is what we're going to what i'd like to contrast here with the, the approach that was done with 1955 so mm -hmm. if we if we first of all we talk about the best possible intentions i think i'm sure there were people involved somewhere in these different reforms in some sense who simply wanted to take a look at certain ancient things that have been lost and say, hey, let's restore those. Now, for there are many ancient things that are, are now lost, which could be restored. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, right now we have a problem with public uh, pro-choice politicians. Mm -hmm. Well, in the early days of the church, if you committed adultery, you had to you know, fast outside the church for two years. <laughs> you know, like an intense, you know, we don't have anything like that before, uh, anymore. But could there be a place for restoring something like this sort of public penance? I don't know, maybe. But uh, the point is that the the idea of restoring something from the past that has been lost is not in itself a, a bad thing. It could be a good thing, mm -hmm. um, like Jerome did. And so um, the church basically takes both. It, it, so it preserves the tradition. It keeps the Latin Missal as it is. But also says, oh, there's also this Vulgate, which we think is actually more accurate to the original text, but we're going to keep the other tradition as well. So um, that's the best possible intention. So the best possible intention was saying, <clears throat> hey, it is in ancient time. We can read in, in the fathers that they did keep an Easter vigil in the night. Mm -hmm. That's been lost. They, they did keep this uh, Paschal candle in the dead of night on Easter Saturday in the night. Okay, well, why don't we do restore that? Could that be a good thing? Okay, so like if we think about the best possible intentions, I think that's we could say that. Now, on the yeah. other hand, we know that the modernists they use this good intention and they twist it, mm -hmm. and they tr they basically say, "Oh, we're going to restore this early practice." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know what? You know what they had in the early church? They had deaconesses. They mm -hmm. had uh, female deacons. Let's restore that. You know, so what they're actually doing or like communion in the hand is one of the most nefarious mm -hmm. examples mm -hmm. because that that's a terrible bait and switch basically by the modernists. So, so they basically like handpicked certain, certain things in the early church mm -hmm. to impose their modernism. So, so the problem here is that we have a, so let me, what I mean to say is I think we can point, we could uh, say there, there may be certain good intentions, mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there could be these bad intentions. And we know that there are bad intentions because, uh, for example, there, the famous quote um, about the 55 is that it, quote, pierced through, mm -hmm. it was the battery and ram, it was the battery and ram, which pierced through our hitherto static liturgy. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the quote that helps us prove the thesis that you mentioned in the beginning. Um, and I, I, let me see if I can find that right now. Who said that? Because I just had it uh ahead of the battery ram which okay yeah so it's um braga i think is who it is let me find this citation I, have you heard that uh yeah quotation? I, i've heard something similar yeah. i know that one a couple of the quotations while you're looking this one up because i'd be curious to get that one but one of the ones was even just in the missile romanum 
of Paul VI when he said, talking about the uh, the 55 changes itself, he says, quote, it constituted the first step in the adaptation of the Roman Missal to the contemporary way of thinking, which again, right. you can kind of, again, you don't want to read into him what he's saying too much, but you can definitely see maybe based off of other examples, how that could be very negative. And then uh, Bunini himself saying it was the first step in measures of wide scope, an arrow, it was an arrow pointing, referring to the 55 changes. And so, yeah, this is Carlo Braga was the one who said the battering ram quote. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's from the art. That's from the article on Robate Celi, the reform of the Holy Week in years 1951, 1956. Okay. That's linked on. Um, it's actually links from Kwasniewski's article, but OK, um, you can link that. But but um, I think there's also a third intent. So, like, first of all, we have this idea of restoring ancient things, which can be good or bad. Mm -hmm. But then we also, I think we have a pastoral reason, like Paul VI just said, adapting to modern times. Okay. Um, well, that could be also good or bad too, mm -hmm. because um, there's, you know, adapting to modern time. I mean, we could talk about like quo primum. Quo primum is adapting to a desperate times call for desperate measures. Mm -hmm. It's actually introducing an innovation into the Roman rite by imposing the Roman rite on every other liturgy that's not 200 years old uh, because it was a desperate situation. So we could even we could even say that's adapting to a modern situation. Mm -hmm. Or we could say, we could we could say like um, the the creeping of the Easter vigil to Easter Saturday morning mm -hmm. is an adaption because it's basically saying, it's basically tell, like the faithful are, for example, they're fasting all Good Friday they're mm -hmm. fasting very rigorously so they just kind of creep that easter vigil up further and further on saturday so mm -hmm. they don't just they just don't have to fast as long because mm -hmm. it's so hard so that's an adaption to the situation so we can't say that adapting to modern times in and of itself adapting to the situation in and of itself is wrong it's only wrong when you do it in a way that undermines the tradition it's trying to obscure the tradition. It's trying to placate the church's enemies and that type of thing. So then you have, so you have good and bad intentions on that too. Mm -hmm. So it's complex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be it can be complex. And again, this is where it's good for people to look up and research because at the end of the day, you know, we can't judge any man's heart in the sense of we know 100% with certainty that's what he was going to do unless he was just to flat out say it. Um but at the end of the day, that's why it's important. So a couple of interesting things was uh, that I went ahead and wrote down were, okay, so the, the pre-55, it happened, but what were some of the principles that were introduced into some of these things? And so I'm gonna go through a couple of the principles, and then I'm gonna ask you a question about um, a gentleman, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, but uh, Lambert Baudouin, who was, I believe, a, a Benedictine Marxist. I remember hearing about this on one of your shows that you did on this subject. Um, yeah, just to find out some more information about him because it's a, a little fuzzy in my mind, but it was very fascinating. So a couple of these principles for everyone that you'll notice if you're contrasting the 55 and the 62 is uh, the priest in a certain sense has a little bit less importance in the liturgy, a little bit less centrality. An example of this would be say, saying the prayers from the chair instead of the altar, right? Um, and you also find that, again, this is kind of something that's um, emphasized in the new mass in and of itself. Uh, there's kind of like three centers, if you will, um, the table, the chair, and the ambo, right? As opposed to everything kind of happening up on the altar. Uh, the lady also have a much more active role, quote unquote. Uh, and a good example of this would be um, there's a lot more vernacular used in certain sections than in previous years. You also have uh, references to the Jews as a whole, um, either removed or softened up a bit. Um, and this idea that Catholicism is the new Israel has been diminished. Um, and then also just a certain sense of uh, shroud and mystery you can find in certain elements when it comes to things like um, continuing to veil the cross 
or stripping the cross at that moment, you know, at the moment of Good Friday, these types of things. You see these things start to come over time. But where did all of this, uh, I guess, liturgical movement start? So a lot of people will know Dom Garanger and Pope St. Pius X and their great efforts in the liturgical movement. And I definitely agree with both said individuals. They're, both of their works are wonderful. But then there was this one interesting individual that I was interested on in asking about, Mr. Flanders, uh, Lam Lambert Baudouin, I hope I'm saying that right, who from my research was somewhat of a Marxist in his ideas of the liturgy, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, leveling the playing field between priest and lady. Is there any truth to this claim? Well, I, I basically, this is from an article by Carol Byrne. And mm -hmm. this is a very interesting article, which talks about the silent participation of the laity at the mass. Mm -hmm. And she essentially talks about uh, Dom Lambert Baudouin, mm -hmm. uh, 1909. And so he's a Benedictine and he delivers this address in 1909 and Byrne comments. And she says this, quote, the clergy, according to Baudouin, exercised a despotic rule over the faithful, robbing them of their active participation in the liturgy. And so here's Baudouin. He says, what a shame. The liturgy remains the endowment of an elite. We are aristocrats of the liturgy. Everyone should be able to nourish himself from it, even the simplest people. We must democratize, democratize the liturgy, end quote. So here we want to introduce uh, so this is this is a very Marxist way of thinking, and, and and even we could we could say it broader. We could say this is just a liberal way of thinking in the in the term the classical term liberalism, mm -hmm. in terms of like the American Revolution and stuff. It's saying that hierarchy is offensive. Hierarchy mm -hmm. is is something that is oppressive or something like that, which is completely uh, Luciferian. It's, mm -hmm. it's satanic to say something like that because we know that there's a hierarchy in heaven. There's a hierarchy of angels. There's a hierarchy of hierarchy. The term hierarchy means sacred order. Mm -hmm. God created the world with the hierarchy. Denial of hierarchy is simply what Satan did when he rebelled against, uh, he, he hated the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so um, introducing this into the sacred liturgy is just poison. And this is what Baudouin was doing, <clears throat> excuse me, and but it also just makes sense. I mean, we could even, even if we like give the best intentions to Bedouin, that was just kind of like, that was the air that everyone was breathing mm. in the modern, in the 19th century into the 20th century. And so it made sense that people would just start to think this way, because that was the way that their entire, the entire political and social order was being constructed on this idea. Uh, the idea is simply that human dignity is power. If you don't have power, you're worthless, mm -hmm. which is just a Marxist liberal lie. Hierarchy is the sacred order. Everyone has their place. They're the beautiful harmony. It's the harmony is what it is. That's what God created. And that's what the liturgy represents. And so it's very interesting. And so we have the, with the 1955 liturgy, we have the first real, real push for this, even though prior popes, in fact, said some things like that there was actually um was it pius the 11th i think i think it was pius the 11th he makes some comment about oh the laity are all silent participants and um to some degree that was actually true because we had there was so many revolutions in world war one everything was destroying all this catholic ethos so people were just going to liturgy and they had no idea what was going on okay mm -hmm. fine um but then if you introduce this marxist idea into it then mm -hmm. you start to just subordinate, you, you just start, it's just like a steamroller mm -hmm. going, going eventually to the Novus Ordo. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is, it, so in reality, um, there, there has always been, on the one hand, first of all, we have the monastics. Mm -hmm. We've got the rosary on the one hand, and then we have the whole, we've got Mary's Psalter, which is the rosary for the laity. And then we have the actual Psalter for the, the monks. Mm -hmm. simply because the laity just can't pray the whole psalter they just don't have time they gotta plow the field mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's, so there's always there's always going to be a more complicated liturgy in the monastery mm -hmm. and there's also going to be a and the priests who they need to they need to have an elevated spiritual life they need to uh you know they need to pray the whole divine office they need to be in an elevated state 
participate so they can lead the people's spiritual life. So there's always going to be this hierarchy. Um, and then this is where it introduces the other big factor, the 1955 question is, is the customs of the faithful. Because yeah. the, Holy, the whole Holy Week structure was very much a, a back and forth with um, the, the laity had all these cherished customs, cherished devotions during Holy Week uh, that were very well attended. Um, like the Stations of the Cross on Good Friday at 3 p.m., mm -hmm. um, the Seven Last Words of Christ, um, the pilgrimages to the Seven Altars, um, Passion Plays, um, things like that, all these different customs. And then these long, drawn-out, complicated liturgies that is the 1955, mm -hmm. may not be well attended, at a given parish, but that's okay. It's okay if, if, if the, the, the clergy have this feast of liturgy and the laity have this feast of, of devotions. It's okay if there's difference, there's different, you know, it doesn't have to be also this conformity. But even, the, even with that, uh, there were various era, areas with strong attendance at these, at these different uh, liturgies. Um, so it's kind of a, it's just complex. And, but when you start to introduce this idea that there's this class struggle between the laity and the clergy, that's just a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a recipe for disaster. And I'm, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because one thing I found even as a convert to Catholicism from fundamentalist Protestantism was this idea of both. And that you can accept many things, uh, that even just like you said, even say like you can take the breviary, you can take the rosary, you can take, um, you know, the glories of the pre-55 as well as the devotions. And as long as they're properly ordered in their proper context, you can partake or just take part of one, um, you know, and, 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 you know, just all beautiful that way. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to say. So let me go ahead now and I'm going to share the screen. This is an old example that I've seen many videos use of the 1939 Westminster Cathedral schedule for Holy Week. And the reason I bring this up is I just want to show as an illustration to the to the viewer that uh, probably something that you're uh, most most people aren't unaware of is that their times are very, very different in the pre 55 Holy Week as opposed to the 62 Holy Week or the current Holy Week of 1970. Um, without getting into all of these things, because we could definitely spend quite a bit of time, just a couple of highlights that I'd like to point out as an example is here on, uh, as an example, when we look at the times of Monday, Thursday, we see that there are every half hour communion services, right? As well as, for instance, the divine office of none being set at 8.45 a.m., which traditionally is set at three o'clock in the afternoon. And so what's happening is that the church, for pastoral reasons, at least to my knowledge, um, is really starting to bring down a lot of these practices to an earlier point, to the point where um, as they're bumping everything up, you're even starting to see Matins and Louds pop out uh, from, the, from the, 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 the coming up day into your own day. Um, and so you see all of these kind of fascinating things, but this is what really starts to change. And this kind of goes back to um, uh, I guess my next question, which is, there are many theories about why Pope Pius XII um, went ahead and allowed Bunini and this commission to go ahead and change the rites itself. The two main theories that I've heard, um, the first one, uh, I do see some merit to, but I've been somewhat skeptical of, just because I don't know, um, has been that um, his holiness was ill at the time. He was ill, I believe, from stomach cancer, and they were pumping out his stomach, and they were, uh, you know, trying, and, you know, he was kind of maybe making a lot of bad decisions at the time. I know that he did switch his confessor from, at, at the time, a very holy Dominican confessor to Cardinal Bea, right, the infamous Cardinal Bea. Um, so that's one theory, is that he was ill, and he was allowing a lot of these changes. Another theory that I've been a little bit more sympathetic to and I don't know completely, is that Pius XII was just, he didn't actually look at a lot of these changes initially, but rather he just um, heard that they were going to be trying to restore the Holy Week to more traditional times. Again, traditional being early church times. And so I was curious, Mr. Flanders, what your opinion was on this. What do you think 
Um, is there any credence to either of these theories? Um, what's your personal opinion on the Pope's intentions behind this? Um, well, I, I think that the first theory, which I think Taylor Marshall is one who said that, uh, I mean, the, the thing that everyone needs to understand is that every decision by the Pope may or may not, uh, like every decision by the Pope with his name on it, mm -hmm. to what degree he was personally involved in that decision, it may be very little. It may mm -hmm. be very a lot. It may be a lot. It, we, we may have we may never know exactly how much he was personally involved with that because every pope has to have a massive bureaucracy to get mm -hmm. anything done mm -hmm. and so you have to have all your trusted people that you trust and there's 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 going to be a ton of curio people who are just careerism or evil actors or other people so you got to figure out who you can trust and all this stuff all this so we know that there are evil actors and there's always going to be um just different and, and, you know, they're all popes are also relying on reports from people. Like, for example, you think of uh, Pius XI and the mm -hmm. Cristeros. Mm -hmm. uh, Pius XI basically betrayed the Cristeros, but he did so out of by bad false reports. I mean, also uh, censured Padre Pio, false reports again. So it's difficult. You know, it's difficult to be a pope. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there's certainly I think there's truth to the first theory just in and of itself, even if he wasn't sick, you're going to have just we don't really know exactly how much he was totally involved. Um, I, I, again, I think of the Vulgate again, because <clears throat> um, Divino Aflante Spiritu was 1946, I think, uh, which is, oh no, it was 44, 1944, it was during World War II. 1944, Divino Aflante Spiritu, he actually allows translations from the original language mm -hmm. or the original um manuscript which actually is i i did deal with this in my book as well which is where it's not really quite true that there is a written original language because there's a masoretic and there's a greek and there's all this stuff what but it, it kind of to me that at least that might indicate that he was sympathetic to a, a great deal of um archaeology archaeologism if you will um like we but like we said in the beginning i mean that's not necessarily a bad thing but it can be quickly abused by the modernists. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be that he was he was sympathetic to the idea, um, and he wasn't really aware of everything that was that could have been um, going on with the, these different actors. Um, I was just trying to find there's there's a comments on it in this book that I mm -hmm. couldn't find on the fly, but this is the Godmother. So Madre Pascalina was Pius XII's secretary. And this is a conversation between Charles Murr and Madre Pascalina. And they discussed this. And she, he actually asked that same question hmm. that you just asked me to Madre Pascalina. And I, I recall, if I remember correctly, she basically just says that he, he couldn't know everything about everybody, hmm. which is true. Like, we just can't know everything about everybody. And no pope can know everything about everybody. Mm -hmm. But we can know everything by hindsight. And so, I mean, this is just the reality of... of uh, you know, church history, you know, mm -hmm. popes have to make decisions based on the best information they have, and they may not know everything about everybody. They don't. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we, we, we don't have any evidence that Pius XII was actually a bad actor. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we, we, we know him to be an orthodox, pious pope. Um, but even orthodox, pious popes do make errors in judgment or, or missteps or whatever, or misinformation or whatever. So, um, but I, I th the other thing I think of is that Pius XII did have, he did seem to have a, an affinity to the modern world, to mm -hmm. uh, the United States in particular. He, he switched over Vatican finances to uh, a lot of connections with the Americans. Um, he, he also suppressed prayers for the emperor. He suppressed prayer, uh, nobility titles among the Curia. He had a certain amount of, he, you know, he had the famous dress in 19, uh, was it 45 or 40, 44 or 45, the Christmas address that which endorsed democracy. Um, and so, and I don't think any of those things are necessarily bad, but they're, they can be abused. And so it's kind of like, uh, he's a little bit modernizing in some senses, but that was really the debate that had been going on between the popes. I mean, Leo, it, we could point to a precursor to that in Leo the 13th regarding France as well. So mm. um, it's complicated and I don't quite, we might know, we not never know exactly the answer, but 
Uh, he did have a pontificate from 1939 to 1958 um, in a very tumultuous era with lots of bad actors swirling around the Vatican. Uh, I mean, I think he did a pretty good job, actually, <laughs> all things considered, going through World War II and everything. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. That's all I got. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how many of us, if we were ever brought to that position, would do even probably half as good? with the situation right, right. <laughs> so um yeah exactly one thing let's go ahead now and take a look at some of the specific changes ourselves so a good website uh that i'm going to bring up for everyone is restore the 54 or excuse me yeah restore the 54 and it is uh essentially just a side-by-side -side website where we compare and contrast the changes from 1954 to what eventually became the post 55 Holy Week, the 62 Holy Week, essentially. And so let's go ahead and just start at the beginning, and we'll kind of just run through a lot of these things. So first and foremost, uh, Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday begins with the vestment color. So let's start with maybe just even the vestment colors. The vestment colors are violet, purple. And traditionally, this is a sign of Christ the King, as well of his royalty, as well as uh, a sign of you know, penance. And in the old world, it was a sign of um, great wealth because purple, you know, you couldn't just go down to your local um, Hobby Lobby or something like that and just pick up a roll of purple. You, you had to go and it was extremely costly. However, this was eventually changed in the, in the 62 changes, right, to the color of red. So this is kind of maybe an unfortunate thing that you also have, um, that you have. You also have uh, probably, I think this is a lot of people who have at least been to the 55 or heard of the 55 um, or the pre-55, excuse me, uh, change, is that there's the cross banging on the door, right? Uh, where I believe it's the deacon who goes to the door with the cross, kind of like in this photo right here, and he bangs on the door with the cross and the cross is veiled. Um, I heard this, but I wanted to ask you, Mr. Flynn, does the East do something similar to this? Because I remember hearing this from somewhere. Yes, there is a, a similar banging on the door. Uh, it actually takes place at the Easter vigil okay. in Saturday at, on Saturday night, which is, it's, it was always my favorite part, probably besides some of the bridegroom service um, in Holy Week, really is this banging on the door because it's very uh, theatrical and it's just, represents Christ as king taking his authority in the Easter vigil and Eastern rite, it's actually representative of just destroying the devil through the descent into Hades and the resurrection. Uh, but in this case, the Palm Sunday banging on the doors is more the resistance of the Jews to the kingly rule. For example, the parable when our Lord says um, they, uh, they sent a message after him, we do not want him to be our king. Mm -hmm. um, and then he takes vengeance on them at the end of the parable. So it's, it's, it's kind of a violent parable, and this kind of represents the taking of his kingship as, as our Lord comes to uh, Jerusalem on riding the donkey. Yeah, absolutely. You do see that resistance, uh, you know, really echoed in that banging on the door. Um, one thing that's also interesting is that the blessing of, of the palms, right, in the pre-55 missal, there is somewhere between seven to nine, I forget the exact number, um, sacramental, not sacrament, but sacramental blessings upon the palms. Uh, and these were mainly done, you can find when you read a lot of these prayers, uh, I think at least one of them, if not more, talk about uh, how these palms are sacramentals against demons. Um, however, in the post-55 Missal, you see this all kind of changed to where the blessings of the palm is now on a table, right? It's on a separate table as opposed to the altar, as well as there is only I believe one, uh, one of these prayers that's now here. Um, and from different sources I've read, it seems like the reformers um, were just looking at this idea of sacramentals as kind of superstition, just kind of some form of like superstition, like, well, you know, we're modern and enlightened. We don't necessarily need to be worrying about uh, demons behind every corner. Um, and so, you know, maybe, I guess, maybe the modern enlightenment or the rationalist would be like, you really think that palm branches are going to save you from an incorporeal fallen angel, something to that effect, you know what I'm saying? Um, so that kind of attitudes in the air, which is unfortunate. 
Um, did you have any thoughts on that before we, we kept going? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so you see that uh, you also see uh, the epistle is changed from uh, a book, the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, um, where the church traditionally takes this idea that Christians, uh, and this is throughout the scripture, but you see this here as well. Uh, they use uh, this section in Exodus as kind of an allegory of the Christians being the new Israel going into the desert of Lent, right, into the wilderness, whereas the 1962 missile tosses this, and I, I believe replaces this mainly with, um, I don't know if they actually even do substitute it, but you can kind of see a, a bit of that kind of ecumenical spirit that you see with the reduction in these emphasis is on the Jews. But one thing that is cool that both liturgies do have is that the passion of St. Matthew is read. Although it does seem that the reformers did cut out a lot of these sections on the institution of the Holy Eucharist itself, which is very interesting because, I mean, that is the, the source and summit. As well, the last thing, at least I'll say on Palm Sunday, is that the prayers, uh, that the, the final prayer in the 62 is now said toward the people as opposed to um, facing the altar. So those are just some interests, interesting um, differences that I found out. You can kind of already see the orientation, if you will, of the whole project and where it's going to lead. Right. So a truncating, uh, more attempting to make the liturgy participate more, mm -hmm. facing the people. Um, it's it's the same principles as the Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same underlying principles that you'll see. The next really, the only other thing I'll touch on before we jump into uh, Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday, is uh, on, I know on Holy Monday, the, uh, the main prayers for the Pope were suppressed. But then if we jump now to Monday, Thursday, this is, a go, this is a great comparison right here. So to start off with, the mandatum was a set, which is the washing of the feet for, for viewers. The mandatum is, was a separate ceremony that takes place outside of the context of mass. It is also not to be done inside of the sanctuary. And one of the cool stories that I did hear about this was is that in Rome, the Holy Fathers at the time would go and they would wash the feet of 13 priests. And one story I heard, you probably have heard it yourself, is um, the story of St. Gregory the Great, where there were originally 12 priests that he was washing the feet of, but there happened to just be 13 that day. And he, he washed the priests and he said that the 13th man was exceptionally beautiful. Um, and he washed the feet of this 13th man, and then the 13th man disappeared. And it was given to him by, um, I guess, divine revelation, if you will, that this was our Lord whose feet he was washing. So this is kind of where the custom of washing 13 priests' feet um, became. And then in the 1955, it moved to where now the mandatum is happening right after the homily in the sanctuary itself, because you know, now all the lady, lady can kind of watch and observe, and the, the custom now is, is that the Holy Father will generally wash the feet of different lay members. You can do priests as well, but mainly lay members. Did you have any thoughts on just kind of the, maybe the symbolism of taking place outside of the sanctuary, uh, the mandatum, and then moving it into the sanctuary? Well, I, I think that I, I was struck by what Kwasniewski said. Again, I've never experienced it myself, so what mm -hmm. do I know? But I, he, when he experienced that, he found that the other elements of the Maundy Thursday service to be particularly heightened because it, it basically just takes the priesthood and the institution of the Eucharist and heightens those things. Mm. And then it also heightens the foot washing because it has its own separate thing. <laughs> I just dropped, it, dropped my coffee. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it just heightens over the other elements in particular when it separates those things. Mm -hmm. so, so you see that. You also see uh, the procession of two thurifers, right? What, that, that actually is my least favorite position that I serve um, just because the typical thurifer that I, I uh, the thurible that I, that I use is ancient and likes to spill very easily. So shout out to all you professional thurifer uh, out there because I cannot do that job. Um, but there is only a procession of one in the post 55. Um, and what's interesting is communion is distributed from the host consecrated at any mass in the pre 55, whereas communion is now distributed from the, the hosts that were consecrated on Monday, Thursday itself. And this is something that when I read, I found to be very, very interesting was 
kind of this idea that you do see turn into anyway the separation of the tabernacle from the altar that eventually it, you know the reformers kind of have this mentality of wouldn't it be so wonderful wouldn't it be so amazing if the lady were just to have host consecrated right there in front of them right now um, I guess maybe in their mind, they're thinking maybe this would hearken a little bit closer back to this idea of the Last Supper on a visual level. Um, but you do see this kind of weird, it is a little bit odd in the context of, I guess, just the whole Catholic tradition in and of itself, which is, you know, once it's consecrated, it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ until the accidents are gone, right? Until the accidents are completely gone um did you have any thoughts on that that was just something i found to be fairly interesting yeah I, i'm not sure if that just simply has to do with uh yeah certain ancient customs because there perhaps there was not um as much tabernacle customs mm -hmm. anciently in early early church but then it kind of developed especially corpus christi developed we had mm -hmm. the Protestant revolt there was more and more threatens threatenings to the dogma of the real presence and then we have these customs of of the the tabernacle um so it could have been an ancient archaeology gone wrong perhaps mm -hmm. um there's actually an article coming on this very subject of the tabernacles separated from kwashnevsky at one peter five so okay go to that for more uh this week yeah absolutely and then uh, the, the last the last thing that I found to be interesting was the, the stripping of the altars and the veiled cross, and there remained two candlesticks. And then in the 55, it changed to at the stripping of the altar, the cross and the candlesticks were removed entirely, thus leaving everything bare. Um, and as we now transition to the Good Friday, um, this is where I, you know, there's quite a bit of changes, but I'm wanting to focus in on two particular ones. So for those of you who want to see all of the different changes right here, one, you can see them on the screen. This will also be, this website is also linked in the description below if you're wanting to kind of comb through these yourself. But one thing I wanted to talk about was specifically the changes in language that you find for the heretics and for the Jews, um, because I think that this is probably maybe the most controversial element about the uh, pre-55 Holy Week is that you find, first and foremost, when it comes to the seventh oration, as it has right here that's highlighted, uh, is entitled in its title for the heretics and for the Jews. And then it changed and it, you know, even in the preface itself, it is hearkening to this idea that Lord, we're praying to you to bring all those who are separated from your church back into the fullness of faith, back to her holy mother. Whereas in the 55, it changes the title to for the unity of the church right, for the unity of the church, which is a little bit more ambiguous because it can be interpreted in a correct way, but it also can be interpreted in a wrong way in the sense that you might be led wrongly to have this idea that um, everyone is just kind of in the church in a, you know, in a certain sense. You also see the change in language when it comes to the discussions on the Jews, uh, specifically removing the word faithless from the prayer. And there's no kneeling during the oration, during the prayer for the Jews. And the reason that I could find, at least from what I had read on the subject, was that the reason for this was that, you know, the Jews were mocking Christ by kneeling and by hitting him and by spitting on him. And this was one of the reasons why the church um, was not doing this, this action. I don't know the veracity of that argument, if that is true, but I did find that to be at least on a certain level, an interesting perspective. And so what were your thoughts on this, uh, this whole discussion on heretics and Jews and how these titles changed? Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, again, there's, there's some complexity here, because on the one hand, we have a situation that's post-World War II, Mm -hmm. where we just had the the worst blood bloodbath of the entire history of the world mm -hmm. which also included violent targeting of jews in particular mm -hmm. but also baptized christians killing each other mm -hmm. and so we have a, this is what we need to understand about the ecumenical movement it's a post-war especially a post-war phenomenon where we do have these people who've been through world war ii and they're saying we need to just 
back off all of this hatred, try to really work together, try to stop, you know, conflict and all this. So there's, there's, is a good side to this. There's a good side to sort of trying to soften these things a little bit. It's kind of just this post-war mentality, which I think is, that is a good thing. It's like just trying to be peaceful as much as we can. But then of course there's the modernists too. Mm -hmm. trying to use all of these good feelings to undermine the faith. Um, and I was just, uh, let's see, I was just trying to find. So what, and then what happens after the world war II is that all of these Jewish organizations, and it, is, it was actually happening before world war II as well, but in particular, uh, an, the influential French Jew, Jules Isaac, mm. he wrote uh, Jesus a Israel 1946, uh, the the origins of anti-Semitism in 1948, which is where this idea began to creep in, become popular that the whole Nazi National Socialism thing is a Catholic thing, mm. and that was being pushed by Jews, uh, prominent Jews like uh, Isaac or other like the ADL comes into play, um, Abraham Heschel, the famous Jewish theologian, he starts to pressure Paul the Six later on. Um, so there's all these Jews who are kind of pressuring the Catholic Church to do something to because they believe that this is all anti-Semitism came from the Catholic Church, uh, which is a, 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 a complete lie, a falsehood, because the Catholic Church fought viciously against the Nazis and was persecuted for it uh, in, in some places, even more than the Jews were. Um, and so but we have the situation where. Um, this is where this this first change comes in. So the, so the kneeling comes back in for the Jews. And then later on, as you said, the term perfidies, faithlessness, mm -hmm. is deleted. So the 1962 mistal has this modified per for the Jews already. So, mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the modernists are trying to take all these things and undermine the dogma of no salvation outside the church, both for the Protestants as well as for the Jews. Mm -hmm. And for more viewers who want to know more about the subject of Catholicism and even just the history of Judaism, uh, to actually plug your series on it, uh, it's a patron-only series, if my memory is correct, on the subject of the Jews. Uh, I myself uh, have gotten to see a couple of those episodes. It's a very fascinating subject, so I'll link that in the description below as well, um, that overall subject. Uh, last thing I wanted to talk about, at least on the context of Good Friday, was how they... Um, the laity were no longer they the laity were not receiving communion on this day however they were adoring the cross and one thing that i found to be interesting about this whole discussion was is that whenever you look at some of the the theologians on this subject they even use the term and it's a it's a debate but even the term latria for adoring the cross um, i just found that to be fairly interesting but you do see this idea that in the pre-55 the communion of the faithful is to go up and to kiss the wounds of our Lord, to adore the cross. Um, whereas in the, uh, the post-55, it changes to the lady receiving communion on that day as well. Uh, although it is not a mass, if my memory is correct, uh, it is uh, the hosts, I believe, are consecrated on a separate day. I might be wrong about that last part, but um, don't quote me. Finally, uh, to go ahead and finish up at least this discussion, and then I'm going to get to the last thing, was the Easter vigil itself. And a couple of interesting things I found out were uh, that the, the, the fire could be started with flint, flint and steel. And that this fundamentally harkens back to a, a custom or a, a saying that the early fathers would say, which was that Christ leapt from the tomb like spark leapt from the flint. Uh, and so when our Lord was in the tomb, it wasn't that he just, uh, or excuse me, when he was rising again from the dead, it wasn't that he was just kind of sitting around waiting for something to, to happen. It's not like he just took three days off, if you will. Rather, he was on the mission of his father, and he leapt from the tomb when the time was fulfilled to do so, uh, just like sparks would be flying uh, when you strike Flint itself. So this was just something I found um, that's kind of minor, but it's still a good symbolism because in the post-55, fire is able to be lit in any manner um, that you want. Um, and then the last two were that you find the large uh, and beautiful paschal candle 
um, is a, a, a three, a triple candle, if you will. And from different authors that I've looked at, I've heard this called the three Marys, that this is referencing the three women that come to the tomb of our Lord. And the, you know, you, you have to add grains of incense that are blessed outside the church. And the fire is given because of that, because it's representing the three women bringing uh, the incense and the, the myrrh to anoint our Lord's body, uh, as well as, of course, other things along the nature of the Trinity, three days in the tomb, et cetera, et cetera. I was curious, what were your, your thoughts on, um, I guess, the changing of taking away the, the Paschal candle, or excuse me, that, that three triple crown candle, and then just removing, like, just kind of abolishing that and moving on? Yeah, I'm not sure if that particular change was, I know that basically all of these changes are either allegedly restoring something ancient, like for example, the red vestment on Palm Sunday was allegedly some ancient thing, but that turns out to be historically wrong. Mm -hmm. Or it was literally inventing something new just for the sake of having more lay and participation. So I'm not sure if this particular change was alleged to be some kind of ancient restoration Mm -hmm. Or if it was just like, we just want to make it less complicated for the lay faithful or something. I don't know in this particular case. Yeah, I know that if you, if the, if for the viewers out there, if you want to see, if read two interesting books on the subject to kind of get a um, both sided perspective and kind of a, a longer historical perspective, um, the book on the, the Roman liturgy by Jungman, as well as the book by, um, why am I blanking on his name? Great Bennett, uh, great current, li currently living. Open Bennett, read. Open read, yes. Yeah. Um, who responds to a lot of these critiques by Jungman of kind of this uh, antiquarian um, historization of the liturgy. Because again, right, we don't want to say that we can't ever restore something, but it actually has to exist. It can't just be uh, kind of making things up out of thin air, if you will, but then calling it um, historical. And then the last, uh, the last thing was uh, you, you do see 12 lessons are sung, and this is eventually reduced down to four. And maybe this is just because of the time, right? You see that the vigil is restored to the time of the evening. But the thing I found interesting was this, the baptism of the catechumens. And for this, uh, what I, one thing I found really interesting about this was the fact that you see baptism taking place in the back of the church, right? Baptism being that great door to salvation, that great door into the church, whereas baptisms now are really brought up into the sanctuary. So again, kind of this idea from um, Lembrandt uh, that you're, yeah, you're kind of seeing this blending of the laity and of the, uh, of the excuse me, of the faithful and of the priests um, that you do find to be, you know, it's not, I would say like evil in maybe the modern sense, but you maybe say evil in a certain Thomistic sense in the sense that it's lacking a certain good that could you be maybe more particularly seen. Of course, we want to be careful with the word evil and explain that for people, but um, it does, it is lacking a certain veracity and not showing the right in and of itself, I think in the clearest of ways. And so did you have any thoughts on just the, the Easter uh, vigil liturgy as a whole? Yeah, uh, here's here we can point out that some of the changes with the 55 were actually reversed in the Novus Ordo. The Novus Ordo actually improves upon the 55 in some ways. And this is an example because the 12 readings were restored at least as an option in the Novus Ordo. Yeah. So okay. there's there, there was 12 readings and then um, reduced to four in the 62 and then the 69 actually restores 12. Now, here's another thing that's actually very rarely commented on. Uh, but there's actually another visual service. It's the Pentecost vigil. Yes. And it's, it's almost ex exactly the same thing. It's a 12 reading service. And it's just beautiful because unfortunately Pentecost, Pentecost is really the third greatest feast of the year. And it really just doesn't get enough credit, <laughs> even though we have a whole season called after Pentecost. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so it's really quite beautiful to have this other Pentecost vigil. And that was abolished in 1955, mm -hmm. kind of hastily. Like they just, it's not, it seems like they didn't really just have enough time to even do anything. So they just said, well, just throw it out. And actually the Easter Vigil was uh, restored in the Novus Ordo um, in, in, I think it was the third typical edition. But, and that's not to say that the Novus Ordo did those things right. It's simply saying, hey, like when we're talking about problems with the 55, this is not like a crazy, rad trad theory or whatever you want to call it even though Vizardo admits like there was a problem with 55 because they changed it back so 
uh, all I'm saying is, um, you know, we can we can discuss this, and uh, I, I think that my my bottom line here is that I think that the church, like the the problem with 55, the biggest problem to me is that it should have been handled just like the Vulgate controversy was handled. Like, mm-hmm. okay, we could introduce certain innovations in certain churches, in certain parishes, optional. I mean, I, in my opinion, uh, it's just my opinion, who am I, whatever, but um, what if what if the Holy Father would have said, hey, here's this new version and just send it to all the bishops of the world. You can introduce this in your diocese if you want to. Mm. Or in in very church in various churches if you want to, and see how it goes, and just let the bishops deal with it. Because um, instead of just because again, especially it's destroying these customs of the faithful. It's just like mm. overturning what you know. What what if you know what if you had a dying parish in some you know <laughs> metropolitan area? Nobody was even coming to anything. Okay, let's have a new service now. Okay, go for it. Like maybe that'll work. I don't know. But like, why would you take this thriving parish that has you know everybody's attending? And just destroy all their customs, destroy all their devotions. Well, we need to introduce some, something new. That's that's uh, I think, and, and I mean, and I would I would I would bring this principle into also the Novus Ordo discussion because, um, you know, the, the biggest issue is that it's to me it's not even it's not even as bad. It's the biggest issue is not even um, the Novus Ordo itself. It's the fact that the Latin Mass was just abolished. Like it would be one thing if he said, okay, we're just going to allow this other mass as an option. Mm -hmm. And then you could just see organically all the faithful would just stay with the Latin mass. And then we might have people go to the Novus Ordo, God bless them, whatever, but that, that just wouldn't survive. We would see we're going to sort of an organic working out of the situation. Uh, I think that would have been the the proper approach. Like if we are, you know, if we have to introduce some kind of innovation, Mm -hmm. if it has to happen or whatever, to me, I think that that's the more, traditional approach which i see with the vulgate controversy mm-hmm. um and that's why i think that's what the approach should be restored sumorum pontificum was basically that approach it was saying let's just let everybody do it and i think that was kind of the approach they were following with 1955 as well they were giving options for various parishes to do it optionally and just let it let it grow let it uh, freely um be uh just something organic i think the the thing that I think that the trads need to come to grips with is that the post Tridentine liturgical history from cor- core premium to to now is itself an innovation. Like the the fact that imposing the Roman right on everybody and having a sacred congregation of rights in Rome dictating everything that's an innovation. Now, as I said, desperate time call for desperate measures. Mm-hmm. Like it was justified. It was a good idea. It was a good decision at the time, but that's that's kind of like it's it's like anti-subsidiarity like it can't it it, it we are, we're we're bearing the fruit now of, of that that whole thing and in, in that um that idea of just a top-down liturgy where we can just rewrite the entire mass and then impose it on everybody else that's mm-hmm. just it's inorganic it's not it's not traditional it's not really the way of the way that the church has introduced you know true innovations that could be good like the vulgate um so that's that's my bottom line on on this whole question. I think um, there needs to be a tr- a true restoration of a of a true liturgical diversity in some sense, not in the modernist sense, but in in like the you know the twelve hundred sense, you know, mm-hmm. or the Sarum rite and these various ancient rites that that were at one time more prevalent. So mm-hmm. that's my uh, that's my concluding thoughts, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I guess one thing I like to point out to the viewers when it comes to all these things, whether it's private devotions, whether it's the mass, the most important thing that you need to be focusing on is, is this going to lead to a more theocentric life for you? Because at the end of the day, that's what the mass should is, is oriented toward. It should be the worship of almighty God, not the, or at least in its primary sense, the, um, the feeding of my own desires, if you will, right? God in his goodness gives us his body, blood, soul, and divinity at mass, but that's not the reason that we go primarily. We go to adore God, to give petitions to God, reparation to God, and to ask um, and to give thanksgiving to God. So that's something that's important for everyone to realize, especially as we're going into this Holy Week. Well, all right. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was definitely uh, not only just a fun chat, but also it's just good to catch up with you at the same time. Um, For the viewers, all of the links uh, that have been mentioned will be in the description below. 
And as always, may our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. Ave Christus Rex.